Hello and welcome to the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast, where we listen to people's fairy encounters. But take heed, we're not talking about winged tinkerbells here. These are real fairies, real encounters that took people like you and I by surprise. Stay a while and hear their stories. My name is Joe Hickey Hall and I'm a folklore researcher. Dear listener, how are you? I hope you're well. This is a special episode as it's the last one which I'll host during the summer, but more about that shortly. I've been noticing lately that many friends and associates are experiencing an uptick in anxiety in their lives. I'm not referring to generalised anxiety where you're triggered by a wide range of situations, but specifically the kind that arises in particular situations. It may be to do with a close relationship or some other situation that you're in or some kind of event that you're expected to engage with regularly. I found it interesting that this topic came up separately with several different friends and I have experienced this myself too and they were seeking advice about how to release that anxiety. I feel it may be important to share my own thoughts and experiences here, in case it's of use to anybody. These specific anxieties, I feel, are clear signs of tension about certain situations that we're unhappy in. It's so easy in our busy lives to override these feelings, or as not being valid, or medicalise them in some way, or ignore them because we feel we don't have time to really stop and listen and receive the message that is being communicated. In fact, from a young age, we're actively taught to override the feelings when something doesn't feel right to us, or we don't want to do something because of societal expectations. We talk a little about this towards the end of this episode. If you are experiencing anxiety, then there's something that's making you feel unhappy, and it's important to firstly acknowledge that and take just one step in the direction of changing that. And it can feel quite scary to do that alone. I know how hard it is in the UK anyway to get access to counselling or therapy, but do put yourself on a waiting list if you haven't already. I can speak from personal experience that any kind of support like that can be life-changing, but what can help in the meantime is meditation. And I know I talk about Insight Timer app, quite frequently because that's what I use. I'm not being paid to mention Insight Timer in any way. It's just that it's free, it's accessible and it's just such a help to be able to listen to a meditation in the morning when you wake up or when you go to bed at night or if you've got you know a little bit of time in the day maybe on your lunch hour or something just to sit for 10 minutes and listen to a free meditation on the app is just yeah it's life-changing. And when you quieten the mind and go within and find your inner guidance It's just such a rich source of support. You become your own support then. Another source that I and many others feel they have experienced is a feeling of support within nature. So either just walking or perhaps sitting somewhere that feels peaceful to you. Again, connecting in, meditating with your back against a tree trunk. Even if it's five minutes a day, just spending time in nature or or meditating there will begin to help. It will bring you a sense of peace and eventually the strength and clarity to make the changes that you need to make. As always, trust your intuition and get used to listening to your own feeling responses and honour them. I'm not a professional healthcare advisor, but I'm simply sharing advice based on my own experiences as a fellow human being. If you are experiencing heightened anxiety or depression which needs immediate help, I would always recommend phoning Samaritans who are excellent at signposting you to find the support you need. And simply talking to another human being is in itself very healing. And find your community. There will be people that live near you that are seeing the world from your perspective and that are there to join together through this time. It's massively important at this time to join with each other and to feel that connection. Now on to this episode, which presents a number of absolutely fascinating examples of encounters with non-human beings and discussions on how these experiences can affect our lives. Many of us who've had these fairy encounters report having had all kinds of strange interactions throughout their lives. 
and a good number of people describe instances where they've met people that they felt sure were from somewhere else, not of this world. Some might view these other people as aliens or ghosts, and they may even be fairy beings in many cases. Again, the potential explanations overlap with the shared phenomena, including the ability of these beings to appear and disappear, having strange otherworldly qualities like piercing eyes, talking or behaving in a strange manner, or inducing a great fear or apparently irrational reaction of bewilderment in the experiencer. Of course, we understand that many of these factors could simply be explained away as people that might seem particularly unusual to us. It's always in the eye of the beholder. And some of them might just be human beings that are slightly unusual to us. But what is interesting is that it's common for the experiencer to walk away with a specific sense that they just met someone who was not human. I feel inclined to listen to what people say they think they experienced. We need to start understanding and listening to people. In this case, our guest's mother had so many of these sorts of experiences that she began calling them the people that aren't people, which I think is great. One of the stories in particular brought to mind two figures present in paranormal and folkloric studies, the character of the trickster and the mythical figure of the wandering Jew. We will discuss these figures further in the end discussion. The bonus episode covers some further encounters that took place just outside our guest's home and more lately inside her home. We discuss psychic protection methods and ponder on what might be causing these latest experiences. Now, as I said, this is a bit of a special episode and it is longer than usual because partly because it's my last for the summer while I focus on childcare during the holidays and continue writing my book. But never fear, the podcast will roll on throughout the summer as four amazing women have teamed up into pairs and will be presenting the following two episodes in a Modern Fairy Sightings podcast host takeover. The first is hosted by Kate Ray of Hair in the Hawthorne and Claire Casely of Fairy Whispering podcast on the 6th of August and they are talking gnomes and pixies. I have had a sneak peek to this and I can tell you it's a fantastic episode. And then the following episode will be hosted by Bethann Briggs-Miller of Eerie Essex and Icy Sedgwick of Fabulous Folklore. And they're going to be cooking up some sort of glorious mischief for listeners too. And that will release on the 20th of August. I am so grateful to these four amazing women for helping me out. And I'm delighted that listeners and watchers will get to meet them if they're not already big fans of these women like I am. Here's a bit of an introduction to each of them and I will introduce them properly at the beginning of their episodes. But Kate Ray has just released a very funny and wise book about the Woolerton Gnomes case from the Gnomes perspective. Do check that out. I'll be putting the link on the show notes. Claire Casely is a fairy artist and researcher and her own podcast Fairy Whispering features all kinds of interesting guests. Again, I will pop links to all of these on the show notes. Bethan and Ailsa's podcast, Eerie Essex, is hugely entertaining and they recently interviewed Alistair Beckett King of Lawman, which is excellent. Plus, Bethan creates the tremendous Spectre of the Sea podcast with Owen Staten. And Icy Setwick of Fabulous Folklore has just released a beautiful book called Rebel Folklore, which presents the most complicated folktale characters from around the world and encourages us to embrace our flaws and be unashamedly ourselves. So massive thanks to all of them. I will still be creating my usual fortnightly bonus episodes for patrons during the summer, as well as our patron Zoom chats and other events. And I will return on 3rd of September for the new series of the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast with some fantastic guests. As always, you can contact me at scarletofthefay at gmail.com. That's scarlet with two T's. And you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at underscore remain underscore curious as well as the YouTube channel. If you have written to me by email and I haven't responded, please email me again. A number of people have contacted lately who had previously sent emails and I had not received them. That was through the contact form on the website. So and occasionally 
some slip through. So please, please, if you haven't heard back from me, do email me again. Don't forget, if you're hankering after more content, there are tons of unheard bonus episodes and other offerings on Patreon. So hop on and join us there, which massively supports the show and ensures its existence. I will be adding older audio episodes onto the YouTube channel over the summer too, so head there to hear your old favourites. As always, thank you so much to all my wonderful patrons, without whom I would not be able to do what I do, and this podcast would not exist. I look forward to seeing many of you on the 26th of July this week for the Zoom chat, which includes a banishing pentagram presentation from one of our fellow crewmates. This is very good for psychic protection, which is always useful to know. These are very handy techniques. And Todd Groob is presenting another fairy tea ceremony workshop for us on Saturday the 19th of August. Enjoy the show and I'll see you at the end for a quick chat. I think the first experience I had that um, was sort of potentially maybe part of um, the other folk Mm -hmm. was that I remember at least my mom and I were out shopping at Walmart, which is like the least magical Mm -hmm. (laughs) American chain um, possible. And we were, this was in a suburb of San Diego, and we were coming out of the store and walking through the parking lot. And we saw these four um, quite short, I would say they were all about maybe five feet tall, a family, a mom, a dad, and a sort of like a late teenage young adult, maybe boy and girl. Um, They had very red hair and they were very pale and they all had sort of exactly the same shape. They were quite round. Um, They almost, they actually looked quite a bit like the dwarves in the new Lord of the Rings show. I think it's the Rings of Power. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, Definitely didn't have that reference point at the, at the time, but um, they weirdly, I saw the the father first because he was sort of like directly in front of me and he had kind of a crazy wild grin on his face. And for some reason, I, my brain just sort of panicked and I, I felt like I should run. Um, even though there were tons of people around, I was with my mom and m- both my mom and I are pretty outgoing. We're also on the taller side. So I, I'd not actually had an experience like that that I can remember um, where I just sort of felt irrationally terrified. And I, we realized that there were, as we kept walking out into the parking lot, they sort of surrounded us. Um, like they had all come from sort of a different, almost like a different compass direction or something. And, um, they said something like good day or something kind of, um, almost archaic and asked us if we knew of any place to walk around. And they had really thick, um, what sounded to me like an Irish accent. Um, and my mom was really quiet and I thought she's heart partially hard of hearing. So I thought maybe she didn't hear the question. So I kind of, I was, I'm sort of used to doing this, just sort of jumped in for her and said, yeah, actually there's a, there's a park near here and was explaining about that and was asking them, you know, what, what they were sort of looking for. Um, and they kept just smiling, these wild eyed grins. And they all looked like they'd sort of been through a windstorm almost, almost or something with the hair. Um, yeah, it was just very bizarre. And so my, my mom kind of started speaking and asked them where they were from. And they said they were from Ireland, that they were here visiting family and just looking for a nature spot to walk around. And, the whole time, all I could think was, I have to get out of here. We have to get out of here. We have to escape somehow. But I was thinking, I'm sure my mom is like, would think that was totally rational. She looks totally calm and composed. So, you know, after a few minutes of chatting with them, my mom kind of said, well, have a lovely day. You know, we've got to get the milk home. Um, Enjoy your time here. And they said, thank you. And we started walking off and I turned to look 
over my shoulder and I couldn't see them anywhere, which was kind of odd. Again, I mean, it was sort of a busy parking lot, but we got in the car and I, I actually wasn't going to say anything because I thought again, that I was just being paranoid and my mom would think it was stupid. And she immediately was like, was that terrifying? Like, were you afraid? What was wrong with those people? Something was wrong. And she was like, they almost reminded me of leprechauns. And I was sort of like laughing with relief. Like, yes, something was wrong. I don't know what was wrong. And she was like, we got to get out of here and just sort of pulled away. And we, the whole ride home, we're talking about how we'd never had that feeling before how it was really strange um, that we felt totally panicked, how we had both turned around and they had sort of disappeared. My mom had said that when they were speaking to us, she was looking to see if other people were looking at them. Like she felt like other people couldn't see them for some reason. Mm. Um, and my mom has a definitely, I would say an interest in the paranormal, but I've never, especially to that point, I had never had an experience with her where she was like, that thing was other or part of the paranormal. Um, and we kind of have joked about it off and on over the years. Um, and I think it was like just such a strange experience because again, I've never looked at people who were otherwise, you know, they didn't look, they weren't standing there with clubs or something, you know, they didn't outwardly look scary and just sort of been irrationally terrified. Yeah. Yeah. What, what were the, um, what was the initial, sort of connection with them then did they why you know where did they appear from and what were they doing when they walked over to you they were just walking through the parking lot but like I said they were all on different sides so I don't know where the one that was behind us would have come from if they had come from in the store I only noticed the man as he was walking directly towards me but you know sort of 50 feet away at least in in the parking lot so we thought it was really strange um, that they would be looking for a nature spot to look around in the Walmart parking lot. <laughs> um, it's possible they had been shopping or were intending to go shopping in the store. Um, but yeah, they just came from the parking lot looking for a nature spot to, mm. to walk around in, they said. Yeah. And what were, what were their faces like, the rest of the family, as they as they looked at you? They, they were all grinning that same sort of crazed grin with these mm. huge eyes, um, really wide, big eyes. Um, it, it kind of, it was just like almost, I don't want to say malevolent, but definitely very mischievous. And they all had the exact same expression the entire time. Like the mom, the dad, the boy and the girl. Healing has helped me many times in my life when I'd reached a point where something needed to change. In 2005, I trained with Martin Broffman to learn the body mirror system of healing, which was life-changing for me. It's based on the idea that the parts of your body that don't work well reflect the parts of your life that don't work well, and about which you have tension in your consciousness. The understanding is that tension is stress, and stress causes symptoms. In a distance healing or in-person session, I move up the chakras, returning each one to wholeness using a colour map. During the process, I see images and situations. I hear words or receive impressions that tell me something about what caused the tension in that person's life. The feedback at the end of the session is a really big part of the healing. If you're interested in a chakra healing session, you can contact me at scarletofthefay at gmail.com. Yeah, because I, I remember when you um, wrote to me about this and um, what I was asking you was um, what was my immediate thought was, well, what was on that car park, car park before, uh, you know, before it was a car park, what was there? And I think you meant, was it a farm? It was. It was a farm of an Irish immigrant who had right. come from, oh, I'm blanking on the name of the area, um, I've not been to Ireland yet, um, personally, uh, but he had immigrated and come directly to this part of San Diego and bought the land and, um, yeah, turned it into a, 
a farmstead and his house was not far, very near where, where the spot where the store now stands. So his house is no longer standing, but it was located very near. And the whole thing was part of his farmstead property. And this was in the 1800s. Yeah, that is interesting. And so how did it feel in your body to you when these people appeared? I felt like seeing like a wild animal or something in the, yeah, in in the canyon or something. There's lots of canyons near where I live. And I think it just provoked this kind of immediate fight or flight response. Um, And it just felt like run. That was the, but it was so irrational because they were walking slowly. It was the middle of the day. There were lots of people around, but it, and my mom had said after the fact as well, that that was how she felt the second she saw them. Mm. Um, We think possibly, you know, the kind of creepy factor was added a little bit by the fact that they had all sort of come from different directions, which made it feel like they were surrounding us. But I felt that sort of fight or flight response before I even realized that there were others just seeing the one guy approaching. Did he have eye contact with both of you then? He did. Yeah, it is. It is an interesting one, isn't it? And I guess, you know, we'll never know. But the thing is, is you've got to trust that, that feeling of just this is, this is wrong. This is very strange. And you can recognize that people don't quite seem what they, what they might seem on the, on the surface. There's a kind of knowingness about that, isn't there? Yeah, there is. I, I definitely had not had that experience. And I, I'm sorry if you can hear my dog going down the stairs. Someone's, yeah, Yeah. a a delivery person (laughs) just rung the bell. Um, Yeah, I think I I hadn't, I definitely hadn't had an experience like that before this happened. I think I said, I may have said already, I think it was about 10. Um, And I wasn't prepared for that. That's not something that I had grown up hearing about. Um, I'm I'm not Irish of Irish descent. There's a lot of Irish Americans, um, of course, but that's not part of my heritage. And those stories aren't really weren't were definitely not part of my upbringing. So I actually feel like I had found your podcast, um, as I mentioned, through a different podcast, Mm -hmm. which I had sort of found totally randomly. And then when I was hearing other people speak about experiences, I was like, oh my God, that's kind of what that sounds like, isn't it? And I told my mother this and she was like, yeah, well, I told you, I thought they were leprechauns. And I was sort of like, well, I I mean, I knew you said that, but I, we don't even do, do you really believe in leprechauns? And she was like, well, I don't not, (laughs) not anymore. (laughs) So, you know, obviously don't, don't know what they were, but I kind of wish I'd had a a rubric in my head at the time to be like, oh yeah, that checks that box, doesn't it? Yeah. So what about your mum then? Because that's interesting, isn't it? Because I think you mentioned your sister ha- has kind of sensitivities as well. So what sort of experiences has your mum had, if she's had any at all? I don't know. I'm trying to think if she's had any. She has had a second experience and this was with a person that she was convinced we call this is a term we had borrowed from somebody else, but when we were referring to these kind of incidents, like between each other, we call them the the people that aren't people. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. that is, that's great. And I've just got tingles down my back. I, <laughs> that is, I, know I can't take credit for that, but it's sort of like, wow. especially when you have no idea what you're talking about and you're not well versed in these areas, it was like, you know, we know exactly what we mean, but um, yeah. yeah, without having to sort of categorize something. So we had this experience where, so I had an experience when I was living in Chicago. I was walking my dog down the street and um, it was really, really a nice area on the lake. Um, it was pretty cold and windy that day. So the streets were sort of relatively deserted, but it's along, you know, a populated road, d- definitely not in a rural area. This is in a Northern uh, suburb of Chicago. And my dog, who's was a very, very confident dog, um, uh, she s- kept turning around to look behind us and was sort of whining. Um, and I thought maybe she was bothered by the wind, but again, 
we'd been living in Chicago. She was born in that area. So I hadn't experienced this with her, but she kept sort of checking over her shoulder. And then I started getting sort of a creepy feeling of being watched, but I was thinking, well, maybe it's just because the dog keeps turning around. Maybe the dog's bothered by the wind. I don't know. And then one of the I think finally the dog started really getting vocal and sort of tugging at the leash sort of to go on ahead and glancing over his shoulder in this kind of frantic way. And I looked behind us and there was a man, I'm assuming it was a man, there was a figure, um, you know, like a person in all black with a, like a black sweatshirt, black jumper with the hood up. And I thought, okay, well, that's weird. That that wasn't there a second ago, but obviously maybe he's just come out of a house and I guess the dog is bothered by him for some reason. And the dog sort of continued this panic and I started kind of walking faster and faster. And it was like, every time I turned around, this figure was so much closer to me than they had been the last time I looked. Like, there's no way, I really feel like there's no way a person could walk that quickly. Um, and the dog was just absolutely getting frantic. And the last time I looked, the man was like, I don't know, maybe 15 feet behind us. I couldn't see his face. He did have a black sweatshirt jumper with the hood up and he it had some sort of whiting on it um, in like flames, like red and orange kind of flame lettering. I couldn't make out um, what the script said. And it, again, when I realized he was that close, immediately, I, again, it felt like that fight or flight response. I was like, there's no way he could have gotten that close to me. In uh, This was like seconds. Like I was checking and this was the whole thing happened in maybe 10 seconds. Um, and I actually started r running. I just took off running and uh, I had only been running, I don't know, five seconds and turned around and it felt like the man was again right behind us so I started praying like please God send help somebody I don't know whoever you've got like an archangel that seems like a good choice um and turned around again maybe five seconds after that and the man was totally gone there was no sign of him I don't think it was a very long very open street I kind of doubt he'd again gone in somewhere that quickly um, but I ran the entire way back to my apartment and um, was really freaked out. Nobody was home. So I called my mom and my mom was like, oh, my God, I saw that man in San Diego. And I was like, how is that possible? And she said this had been like a couple of weeks prior, I want to say. She said she was walking her two dogs with my dad in their local park. And there were other people. She said there weren't a ton of people. Same thing. It was kind of a windy, overcast day. It was like late, late winter, early spring. And she saw from kind of the other side, sort of like a giant square, this park, from sort of across the, the square, she saw um, a man in a, all black, a black hoodie, and she felt like he was moving really quickly, and it kind of freaked her out. And she didn't say anything because she felt like there was sort of nothing to say. And she was waiting until he got closer. And she said when he got right up close to her, she felt this overwhelming feeling of fear and dread. And she could not see a face inside the hood, which really disturbed her because she felt like she was close enough that she should be able to see a face inside the hood. And she said the same thing. He had red lettering, like flame lettering of some script that she couldn't make out on his hoodie. And um, she said she had the overwhelming feeling that if she'd reached her hand out, it may have gone through him, like he wasn't really there. And she said the dogs didn't react at all, which is strange because usually when people go by them, they get, you know, kind of excited because they want to be pet or whatever. Um, and as soon as he was ahead of her, she looked at my dad to see if he was looking at the man, which he wasn't. And she looked back and the man was gone. Mm -hmm. So she immediately asked my dad, did you see the man that just passed us? And he was like, no, I don't think a man just passed us. And she said there was a man, tall man in a, in a black hoodie was sort of describing him. And he was like, no, I didn't, I didn't see him, I guess. I don't know. I guess maybe I was in in my head or something. And she was like, I really don't think anybody else at the park could see this man. I just had that feeling. I don't know why. And it exactly matched up with my description. And it was only a couple of weeks apart, but nothing that we can remember 
like happened around this time, you know, something really good or really bad or, or anything, but we both had these really strange experiences sort of while out walking the dogs in totally separate, separate cities. And I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with the U S but Chicago is about a five hour flight for maybe four hour plane ride from San Diego. It's um, quite a ways away. It's making me think that, um, because I know you've had some other experiences as well, and it really makes me think that there's something within you that, you know, may you may have inherited from your mom, that you can see either well, people from other realms, either dead people, you know, people from these other realms, like, you know, perhaps, perhaps the Fae, um, and other types of beings that other people don't see. Do you know what the times of year were for both of those experiences? I well, I I know because uh, I do remember other things that I was doing. That I've sometimes I have a good, pretty good visual memory of things, and I actually remember certain sort of v visual cues when I was living in Chicago for what I was doing. And I want to say that was around March. Mm -hmm. The other, the first incident with the Walmart, I. I don't remember. I can't say it was really hot out because um, I remember being hot coming, standing there speaking to them. And I remember thinking um, that part of San Diego is kind of inland. And um, I had been thinking to myself that they should be going to the beach <laughs> to cool down <laughs> instead of, um, you know, looking for a, a park in that particular area. So I want to say it was probably late spring or summertime. Yeah. And do you remember what they were wearing? Pretty normal looking clothes. I think they had on sort of jeans and t-shirt type things. They're, they're not, not interesting in any particular way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, when you put it together with some of your other experiences. Oh my gosh. Oh, the hitchhiker. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. That, yeah, that, <laughs> That's so funny because this was actually one of the times I saw this, somebody was with me, which was so validating. I immediately yeah. screamed at my friend, like, can you see that man? And she was like, yes, he's very strange looking. Of course, she's quite a sensitive person as well. Um, so when I was about, this was in maybe, let's say 2007 or eight at the latest, I was driving, I want to say it was around 11 or midnight because I, I think I still had a curfew. Um, around this time. And I was coming back from some sort of event or friend's house through um, a part of San Diego that's, it feels quite rural. A lot of the houses have more land around them, but it's a very, very wealthy area. For a long time, it had the highest per capita income um, of anywhere in the United States. So it's not... Um, sort of the middle of nowhere, but has a very sort of beautiful, sort of like a posh country feel to it. Yeah. Um, and you never see weird things there <laughs> at all. Um, so I was driving back home through this area coming from, from someone's house, I think in the, in the area. And I, I was pulling up to a stop sign. It was quite dark there. There's not a whole lot of street lights um, in this area, or at least there weren't at the time at night. And I could see that there was a man with white hair, like sort of stood by the stop sign. And as I slowly pulled up, I realized he looked exactly like somebody from the haunted mansion ride at Disneyland. <laughs> he was also quite short. Um, you know, his face was kind of at the window level of my Mini Cooper without him really bending down. Um, and he had on like a big coat, sort of like a big old, old fashioned, I guess, looking leather coat mm -hmm. and white hair, very white hair that was sort of really long and stringy. And he had giant, giant blue eyes that were very like a sort of milk. They were like milky blue. I don't know how else to explain it. No, and he was no, hitchhiking no. and he made direct eye contact and smiled very slowly. This really creepy knowing smile. Like he wanted me to see him and be afraid. So for some reason, things like that 
just pissed me off, especially when I was a teenager, sort of took that as a direct challenge, even though, once again, every cell in my brain was screaming, like, get out very quickly. So I looked him directly in the eye and smiled really slowly myself and then moved on. But obviously I was terrified. And I spent the next day, like, combing Google for sighting that because that is something that in that area would be very unusual Mm. someone hitchhiking in the middle of the night in he he looked I mean looked sort of like a ghost or some sort of otherworldly being um but he his clothes didn't he didn't look homeless his clothes like someone who was unhoused his his clothes were clean he was clean um So I was just sort of, it was, again, the kind of neighborhood that if they were experiencing something like that, I feel like it would have been on a forum somewhere. Yeah. Um, But but nothing came up. And that's sort of haunted my memory. And I've got family that lives near there. And um, so I've driven through this same area many a time. And I think of it every time, even in the middle of the day. And then maybe 10 years later, I was driving with a friend who was working over there. We were going somewhere to have lunch and I picked her up and she was in the middle of talking about something. I don't know what. And I saw this man walking in the same area, not the same stop side, the same sort of neighborhood along the side of the road. And this road is actually, it translates to devil's highway. It's quite a, it's quite a beautiful drive. It's quite dangerous actually, especially to be walking on. And he was just kind of ambling along the side of the road with this sort of dazed look in his eyes, but he was definitely going somewhere. He did, did not see us. Um, and then maybe a year or two ago at most, because it was definitely during the pandemic, uh, because I had gone to a grocery store in the area and I remember it being quite a big deal. Like I'm actually going to go in and I was on my way in the store. And I, I remember I was having a weird day that day already, because I remember thinking, of course, this on top of everything else today, (laughs) but I can't remember what else was going on. Um, and I saw this man walking down a, like a median strip. I don't know if it's called the same thing in the UK, but you know, where you can sort of walk down the middle of a surface streets. These are known as central reservations in the UK. It looked like he had a sign, like maybe he was I thought maybe he was begging for money. I don't know. He wasn't begging for money when I saw him, but he had some sort of thing in his hand. And I saw him again when I was leaving. And it was a similar, he he walks every time, except the first time I saw him, he was walking with this sort of limp, like dra- slightly dragging a foot. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was kind of walking with this kind of unseeing gaze. But again, none of these times did he look homeless, unhoused. I don't actually know that he was begging. I know the first time he was definitely hitchhiking. Um, And he's always, I've always seen him in places that just looks like people wouldn't be, wouldn't stand, and that it wouldn't make any sense to be in. Um, And it's, again, it's the same really terrifying feeling, even though, you know, on the outside, he's you know, sort of a shorter, older man with white hair is really not a particularly scary figure. But it was the sense that you got from him. Yeah, that it feels like looking at a person that you know immediately is not a person. Yeah. And I've had two other experiences with those. Do you want me to share those? Sure, yes. Yeah, I, I find it fascinating. So I'll see if I can go in chronological order. So the cowboy one may have been a ghost. It's funny in this context to sort of say, like, I think it was just a ghost. <laughs> nothing, um, nothing strange. Um, but I was walking, um, actually, my neighbor's, uh, parent's neighbor's dog. Uh, I was uh, house sitting or dog sitting or something. And they lived quite near to the canyon. And there is an old ranch house in this canyon. Old Mexican at the time from when Mexico was part of Spain, a Spanish colony, um, cattle ranch, essentially, Um, you know, a land grant that was given to somebody. And um, 
you know, that they were, they were farming and had cattle and some yeah. horses and things like that. Ranch. And yeah. I believe that the house is the oldest, it's one of the oldest still standing ex extant uh, structures uh, on the West Coast. Um, so it's sort of a historical thing. And it's, um, you know, really, it's actually really beautiful and peaceful down there. And I've always enjoyed walking down there. Um, it does I personally think it has a little bit of a spooky feeling. I'm not sure whether that's just because it's old. Um, I'm also a little bit paranoid. So typically I would not walk alone in the canyon, paranoid about, um, you know, just people. But because I had this neighbor's dog, the dog was uh, a giant uh, black dog with orange eyes. And it looked like the Grim. I mean, people would cross the street to get on the other side of it just because it was so um, sort of scary looking. So I felt like, well, I can definitely walk in the canyon with this with this dog. This is sort of my bodyguard. Um, and I was actually really excited because it was one of the first times I had walked alone in, in the canyon, just sort of, you know, listening to music or whatever. I had walked the dog to the park and then was on a trail and I was headed down this trail um, that went sort of parallel to this rancho, the ranch house. And uh, there's a bridge that goes over this tiny little stream. And when I was approaching the bridge, I realized there was a man sat on, on the bridge, um, sort of hunched over, like sleeping. And he was dressed exactly like sort of an old fashioned cowboy. He had on, I think jeans, boots, um, and a, uh, like a poncho, like a Mexican poncho, um, and a cowboy hat. He had a mustache and he was hunched over looking like he was sleeping. And for, it was the same thing for whatever reason, my brain immediately was like wrong, go. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I immediately turned around with the dog and had a the opposite direction, but I think I only got maybe five steps before I thought, hang on, I have the giant scary dog. I will not be put off my joyous, beautiful nature walk. Um, you know, the man is probably harmless. And um, even if he's not, I have this giant scary wolf dog with me. And I turned around, back around, again, maybe five seconds at most later, and the man was gone. And that freaked me out more than seeing the man. And so I immediately, I, don't, I couldn't tell you why, because it actually had not occurred to me at the time that the man was maybe a ghost or something. Um, and I, there was nowhere for him to hide. Like it was a, it's a very, very open area. The vegetation that grows off the trail is not very high. Um, and he was just completely gone. And I, I sort of ran a, a bit down the trail looking for this man and couldn't find him. And that, um, really disturbed me. And I, I actually didn't tell my mom, who's sort of the one person I, I would always tell my sort of spooky incidents to, um, because I thought at the time, because I was a bit, a bit younger, that she might be mad that I was walking alone <laughs> in the canyon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't exactly want to share that information. I didn't, I was sort of too old, you know, not living in the house, et cetera, to get quote unquote in trouble. But I thought, well, I don't want her to worry about me. So I thought I'll tell her when some time's passed. And, um, and so I told her maybe a year, a couple years later, and she was like, well, that was obviously the ghost. Remember when you were really little, we took a tour and they told us that, that people always report hearing sounds of cowboy boots, like disembodied sounds of cowboy boots. So recently I researched, thanks to your um, inspiration, actually, um, I researched the house. And besides the fact that, of course, the vaqueros, like the cowboys did work there, um, during the, I want to say the first half sometime in the first half of the, the 20th century, so the early 1900s, the house was actually a full-time bunkhouse for cowboys. Um, and it was sort of on the old, you know, postal trail and all those things. So yeah. um, I think maybe that is what he was or some yeah. sort of time slip possibly. I, I don't really know. Yeah, could be. And, you know, it's over water there as well. You know, there's often um, what I'm picking up on lately is that a lot of these instances, you know, they, they often turn up by bodies of water. 
And there he was. You mentioned he was over a small stream. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. That's quite and of course it was a bridge, you know? It was. He was sitting on a bridge. So again, liminal space right there. Very. The bri- the bridge. I mean, that's just so symbolic. Um I like that you you you, you kind of took a stand, like you did with the guy with white hair. I don't know whether you've done that in other instances as well, but it's like no, I'm not going to be frightened by this. I'm going to, you know, and it's like a real <laughs> deep, there's something within you that just decides, makes a decision, a deep decision, a conscious decision, not to shy away from that and to not show fear uh, to walk towards it in some way. So I think that's interesting too. Do you think that comes from your mum maybe or? Oh, she definitely has that. I mean, she's the sweetest, but she just is sort of like Snow White. Like everybody says that she was the mom that all my friends sort of like, not because she was the quote cool mom, but she was just very kind and accepting and um, sort of very, you know, doing art projects and speaking to the birds. And, you know, we've had, I think every type of pet nearly. Um, She loves animals and so do I. I think I, I, I definitely think I got that that fire from her. And, but I used to be really afraid of supernatural things. Um, I used to feel like as a kid that I could sense them everywhere, but I never told people that. And I also didn't think if you sensed something or dreamt, I didn't sort of didn't think it counted. And I used to pray like sometimes every night for certain periods that I wouldn't see anything. Um, and it wasn't until I sort of became an adult and was reflecting on that, that I went, oh, it's kind of strange, isn't it? Like, I bet, you know, and I actually did ask friends who said, oh, yeah, I hate, you know, ghost ghost stories freak me out or I can't do horror movies. Like, did you ever pray or worry or anything, you know, that you would run into things like that as a child sort of constantly? And they were like, uh, no. Um, So I think uh, you mentioned that my sister had sensibilities and I think she's also quite a... Um, sensitive person in that way. She doesn't have these experiences as often, but when she was a kid, she did have two. She, she, I think she must've been about three and she came in from the garden. She used to love, we both, we love to play in the garden. And she told my mom that she was so excited that she'd seen a fairy in a rose. She said she was just playing in the garden and she looked down and there was a little face looking back up at her kind of smiling mm-hmm. and that it, she realized it belonged to this little body. Um, and then another time she was coloring or something, um, in the, in the house. And she said she saw what looked like a tiny angel fly through the room. Um, and she says, I I spoke to her about it recently and she says she still remembers those experiences really vividly. And, um, she said, yeah, I never tell people because I don't want people to think that I'm crazy, but I remember those. And I really, I just think that's what it was. I didn't imagine it. I would have imagined, she said, I used to imagine stuff all the time when I would play pretend, but it never felt like it was really there. And those things were, were really there. That's really beautiful. So she, so she had these experiences and it's great that she could, you know, run in and, and, and tell her sister and her mom, I don't know whether she did tell her mom, but she um, did, yeah. She did. And what? Do, how did your mom respond? She was so excited. Like, I think my mom would have loved to have seen either of those things and, and just told her, like, my, my mom always told her, it's probably because you're so nice to the flowers. Like, you were out there being sweet to them and being respectful. And we used to kind of help her water the plants and stuff. We got a big kick out of that. And she said, well, that, that'll be why, um, to my sister, you know, you they... They, maybe they just appreciated your care. So they were just sort of smiling at you. Oh, that's so sweet. What a lovely, what a lovely mum. She does sound like a great mum. And yeah. for yourself, did you have any experiences as a child that you can remember? I think I had a lot of experiences as, uh, experiences as a child. I don't know how many of them were. I, I don't know what you would classify them as. I remember... I think the weirdest one is I was at a, um, I've had, I've seen, actually, I've had two weird experiences at this, now that I think about it, at this um, park. Um, I, I was at a 
I'm trying to think what you would call it. It's not an amusement park. It's sort of like a living museum, I guess, sort mm. of thing. They've, they've got old, this is in the Midwest, um, where my mom is actually from. And the first time I went, um, you know, they've got all these old houses that, you know, that they've moved from other places and old cars and things like that. And um, I saw a man on his stomach in a, what looked like a red coat, actually, like from like a British Revolutionary War era soldier. Um, I didn't make that connection at the time. I just, I still remember what he looked like. And, you know, having seen plenty of historical films or whatever, yeah. um, would recognize him. And he, he looked direct, directly at me. We made prolonged eye contact. Wow. I told my mom about it later, but they did occasionally have people dressed in costume, you know, sort of docents or things she said. And she said he must've been one of those, but I really don't think he was. Nobody else was dressed like that and people were just walking right on past him and it was just me and him sort of staring at each other as I went by mm. like he was looking at me as sort of suspicious as I was looking at him mm. and it was the same thing like he just sort of I looked back and I couldn't see him and um that sort of history isn't really part of that museum um, so I think it would be very strange for him to, you know, for, for there to, to be someone dressed in that sort of time period. Um, and I was very frustrated because my, again, my, my parents were always validating of my experiences, but, you know, they were really convinced that time, like, no, no, that was, that actually must have been somebody. And I was kind of like, mm, I don't think it was. Um, then I was at the same park, um, like, actually quite literally at least 15 years later. Um, I think I was like 24 or five and, um, yeah, like 20 years later. And I was, the park wasn't very full that day and there weren't any of the, you know, people dressed up. It was pretty rainy. This was in, this was in October. Actually, both these incidents were in October, strangely enough. Um, and I, I had been with my mother and my aunt and they went off to go look at something and I went to go look at something else and, um, you know, I just sort of lost them and wasn't at all concerned because we were all adults with cell phones. And um, then uh, ahead of me, I saw this woman walking pretty sort of purposefully in like what I think would be like 1800 sort of like American pioneer clothing, like with a bonnet on her head. Right. Um, and I got very excited because I thought, Ooh, there is a docent working today. Like I, I want to hear her spiel. I, I just love that. I get, I love history and, oh, you know, yeah. theater and all that, all that sort of stuff. So no matter how cheesy it is, I'll, you know, um, I also sort of kind of feel like a, whenever there's somebody giving a performance, I feel like I should listen out of respect, you know, <laughs> at least for a couple of minutes. And I was thinking, well, there aren't many people around today, so I'm going to go, you know, hear her spiel, whatever it is. So I followed her and she went into this like one room, a very old one room, like log cabin that was a historic, you know, building that had been moved from somewhere else. And she went straight through the door and I went straight in after her and there was nobody in the cabin at all. <sighs> Um, it was completely empty. Obviously it was a one room cabin. There was no other way in or out and there was nowhere for her to be. And I still combed like, look as if she was going to come out of the sink or something. And I immediately just kind of like calmly thought, right, that, that one was definitely a ghost. Mm -hmm. I knew it. And then I went back to like looking for my mom and I didn't tell my mom until later because my aunt is really um she used I don't I don't know if she still is but I know that they had discussions when my grandparents were sort of ill and passing um that my aunt had always been afraid of things like that um so just in case I didn't want to mention it with her around so I sort of waited to tell my mom about it later and yeah. she was like wow I can't believe you waited to tell me that and I was sort of like <laughs> well it didn't feel scary I mean it was just clearly a woman and I was hot on the chase and I only realized, oh, it's a ghost when she completely disappeared. And I felt, I did feel a bit, again, there was water, I guess it was raining. So it was, um, mm -hmm. kind of a little bit of a spooky feeling anyway. Um, but it didn't feel scary. So I just kind of care, you know, carried on with my trip and day.
Yeah. Where do you think these gifts come from then? If you call it a gift, I would call it a gift to be able to, you know, hold on to what you see. I mean, kids see this so easily. My kid just said to me earlier that she sees rainbows around people. Um, Wow. You know, I just hope she hangs on to that. Um, I told her that's normal, but not everybody understands that it's normal. Where do you think yeah. you, do you think it's come through, you know, so anybody, do you know anything about your ancestry or anything like that? Yeah. So I've got two potential theories and I guess the answer of course could, could be both. Um, as far as I know currently my, so my dad's side of the family is completely Northern English and Scottish immigrants. Um, I've traced like many different lines back pretty, pretty far. I think I got back to 1530 on ancestry.com, which was, I was pretty, um, you impressed well. with. Yeah. But it was a yeah. big deal for Americans. It's a long way back. Um, uh, and yeah, they, so they were all from again, Northern England and Scotland. Um, and my grandfather was also, sorry, my grandfather, my, my mother's side, my mom's dad was also um, Scottish and English, of Scottish and English descent, uh, with a little bit of German mixed in, but primarily the Scottish and English again. Um, and my grandmother was 100% Polish, and her parents had come over from Poland. My great grandmother, uh, had died long before I was born. And I always heard it joked that she was a witch. Um, but I thought it was a joke relating to, I don't know. She was apparently like a very joyous person, but I, but everybody always said, Oh, oh, her husband always joked. I married a witch. And I don't know. I just thought it was some sort of running joke until, uh, recently I discovered that she was like a known clairvoyant. Um, sorry if you've just heard that massive sigh. That's my dog who's extremely um, <laughs> He's <laughs> agreeing. bored by this. He's yeah. agreeing and the back way is chipping in. <laughs> I, I like that, yes. He's like, yes, yes, that is how it was, like, yes. Yeah. Um, she, so she was a, yeah, I guess known to have a, a number of different clairvoyant abilities and in this small town in Poland, Um, people would sort of come to her for advice. And there was a story that she started packing up a basket of food and somebody in the family said, like, what are you doing? This is back in Poland, I think. And um, she said, well, so-and-so's house is is burning right now, so they're going to need food, and I'm sure they're going to come tell us any second. I guess things like that. And, of course, they did. And she said, oh, I've already got a basket of food ready. I you know, so I guess this was a known, a known thing. Yeah. Um, and she also used to read tarot for people. Um, right. so that seems like a likely possibility. Yeah. Um, I also, so I have something called synesthesia. Oh. There's a, which just sort of means that the, um, senses in your brain are intertwined and there's like hundreds of different types. Um, the type that I have is, um, the, the color type essentially, which is where when I hear music, I see colors. And sometimes I hear music when I see paintings and things, look at art. Typically it works more the other way around though, that I, that I hear music, um, see colors when I'm hearing music. Um, and I was discussing this recently with my dad who, who's very scientifically minded, had a very mathematics focused job. He's not Um, a religious person. It's not particularly, uh, you know, woo woo in any way. And he said, yeah, I think I might have that actually, because that's, he, he plays guitar. And he said, that's how, why I got so into guitar. And he said, I remember when I was a kid, just laying and listening to music and kind of just watching the colors go by for entertainment. And this led to a discussion where my mom then kind of said, yeah. And Michelle, you know, he used to be able to see auras too. And I, I don't really see auras anymore, but I did up until I was like 19 or 20. And I thought everybody saw them. I thought people's bodies just always looked like they had sort of a glow. Mm -hmm. And I, I do remember asking in, when I was in high school, I asked somebody or, or people in my friend group, like, do you guys ever get distracted during class? when the teacher's speaking, because you're just watching the colors that are coming out of them, like on the whiteboard. 
And everybody just kind of laughed and was like, no, but nobody said, what are you talking about? I can't see those. They were just sort of like, no. And so I thought, oh, okay, I guess other people are better at focusing than I am. Right. Um, and I don't think I told my mom, um, I, I had started getting headaches and I said, I think maybe I need glasses. I'm not sure. And I said, but I, I, cause I've noticed sometimes when I'm tired, like the writing on the, the, whiteboard in class like it's a little bit blurrier and I said I can still really see the colors though you know coming out of people's bodies when they stand against the whiteboard it's just making out the letters and she was like what colors and then I was sort of I was like well you know the colors like when people you can really see it when people stand against like white or certain you know walls that are all one color and she was like I think you're seeing auras and I was like no no I don't know what that is that sounds cool but you know I'm just seeing like the normal colors. And I had to, then I went around asking people like, what do you see when someone stands against a wall? If I do it now and everybody was like, you know, nothing, I can't see anything. And so I, then I sort of realized, I guess that is what that is, but it seemed like mundane to me, yeah. to me because, you know, it was like seeing people's hair or something. It's just like, yeah, it's just there. And then I went through a period when I was, um, yeah, ni around 19, where I'd started dating someone who was very um, religious and, uh, you know, was thought anything was either, you know, from God or the devil, which I think is kind of a common American sort of evangelical um, assumption. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he sort of told me, like, you and your mom are way too, and I, we, we weren't nearly as interested in these things as we are now, but he was so horrified hearing us talk about these things occasionally. He was like, you know, this is really demonic. And I didn't actually think that it was demonic, but it suddenly made me feel so stupid and weird. And so I started praying that um, all that would stop. And a, a lot of it did stop. I still had some really strange other experiences in, in that time, but like I stopped seeing auras and, um, and, and I, f I feel like maybe my sensitivities decreased a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure, but that, that was when I sort of stopped seeing auras and I've kind of half thought about, you know, trying to do it again. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's sort of, yeah, silly to like want to again, because I never, if I had, I never thought of myself as having any type of abilities at all. Um, and I thought most people had these experience. And I do think a lot of people have these, as you have said before, have these experiences much more regularly than we realize. But I didn't, I have never thought like maybe I'm, tr you know, until recently, like maybe some of these things are messages, not all of them. I think maybe, a I think some of them are just random, but, and I had never made any attempt to, like hone abilities and do anything with them. I sort of would like to, but I just don't know what to do. <laughs> to do. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was going to ask you what, if you had stopped seeing them when you were 19 or 20, what happened around then? And of course, making a decision, a deep place to close down would, you know, would do, would do that. I mean, you mentioned people standing against, you know, white walls and whiteboards and, that is a classic place to be able to see them. And that's something I've always enjoyed as well, um, watching lectures and watching the colours come off people, especially when they're oh. talking about something they really love or something that means the truth for them, whatever their truth is. If they start talking about their truth, whatever that is, you do get to see these colours come off them. And it's it's fascinating. And it is yeah. when your eyes relax. So I'm glad you didn't get your glasses to make that go away. And I think <laughs> a lot of people, um, I, I mean, I do need glasses now to watch the details on television or if I'm driving at night, whatever. But I only put them on to see that thing that I need to see. And then I take them off again. I do not wear them all the time. And I think it's the reason is because our eyes they are indicators of our relationship with this world. And if there is something, if we're finding that our eyesight's gone a bit blurry, then there's something that's not clear. Literally, mm. there's something that's not clear in our lives. And it's an indication, it's a trigger for us to say, what's not clear to me? There's something here that's not clear to me. And the thing is, you wake up 
from one day to the next, your eyes, which of course the blurriness and the focus is really just the muscles pulling your eyes into tension or relaxing. And so when you go and get your eyes tested um, and they say, right, can you see clearer of this? Can you see clearer of this? Those lenses are pulling your eyes into tension so that you can see clearer. And then when you wear those glasses, it's keeping your eyes in permanent tension all the time. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I learned with Martin Brofman when I learned the body mirror system, because when I first went to to learn that system, I was what you'd call short-sighted, had myopia. Um, So I do find this really interesting because now if I'm really blurry, sometimes I wake up and, or perhaps not from, from when I wake up, I'll notice that day like, oh, things are really blurry today. And then I kind of question myself, well, what's kind of going on for me at the moment? How can I make sense of that? And most days I don't notice whether they're blurring or not, but sometimes sometimes I notice, oh, my eyes are really good today. I can see really well. I can see that hmm. person across the street or I could read something maybe that I couldn't usually on a sign or whatever. And But equally, some days, as I say, I, I notice that I'm particularly blurry. So that's that in itself is quite a good indication of our relationship with this kind of material reality mm. uh, that we call the material plane. And I think with with auras, when you so a good way to see auras is exactly as you say, to have someone stand or sit against a white wall and then just let your eyes relax. Don't try and focus too much. Definitely take off your glasses because your eyes need to just be able to do their own thing. Take your glasses off, look at the person, but just kind of look it's like you sort of look around them without looking directly at them. So you sort of look at them, maybe just above their eye, where the third eye might be, and then just let them go into blur. If they go into blur, just let that happen and see what you see and trust what you see. Because then you might say, oh, well, I can see this colour, but I must be imagining it. But you're right. What you end up seeing is this kind of um, light uh, sometimes it's an inch or a couple of inches deep in that person. That it's a light that glows all the way around them. And that's one layer mm. that you're seeing. And for other people, that might be thicker or slightly thinner. And for some people, that might look like white. Some people, it might look like blue or another color. And then, and when I say blue, I mean kind of whitey blue, like a sort of bluey white color. And then, as you say, when they start to talk, they have these colors come off them. Mm-hmm. And you're just kind of tuning in to various layers of their being. And you might see something slightly different to somebody sitting next to you. They might be picking up on a different other a, a layer of them because we, we have these various auric layers. So, and yeah, it's something that we just, we just do. Uh, but uh, as you say, we, we, we get the impression fairly quickly that that's not the the right way to be seeing things and you better go off and get some glasses and now now you can see now now those colors have gone away there you go you're fixed <laughs> yeah it's so so depressing isn't it I that know. it's like when the these most beautiful interesting things have been taken away now you're normal all right go on ahead <laughs> yeah that's it and and you know when somebody said this is wrong this is demonic you shouldn't be seeing this and of course when you're young and impressionable especially when you're that age and you're in love with somebody or oh my having gosh, a relationship yeah. with them and you just want to feel accepted and you you know you do begin to sort of shut down parts of yourself and you feel well it's not safe for me to share that part of, of me then maybe right maybe it's like still part of you but you just kind of keep it inside and you just make a decision you're not going to show it to people again but as I was saying to you before before we started recording this time that we're going through oh my goodness and I know you're uh, you know, probably feeling it too. It's so important for us for some reason. I I feel it. I know lots of other people are going through this at the moment too. We have to just be able to show who we really are. It feels so important for so many of us at the moment to just say, this is me actually. And I, and I, it's too heavy for me to carry around these parts of me that I can't show freely I'm just not doing that anymore I'm just not doing that anymore and so many people are feeling this so perhaps it is a good time for you to reclaim you know those parts of yourself that you felt you had to hide 
Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. I, I really have been feeling that way. And of course, you know, typical human at first, I thought like it was just me, like this is this is a stage I'm in or this is what I'm going through. But I feel like I am I actually was in there. I'm still in therapy. I personally kind of think everyone should be in therapy at some point. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah, um, I agree. And we were talking about uh, blockages, more like in a psychological sense, things you've um, you're feeling blocked on or, you know, um, sort of things along, along that line. And my therapist had asked me as we were sort of compiling this list, like, think of anything, if you think of anything else that you feel you've sort of been trying to suppress or, or block, um, you know, we'll add it to the list. And it occurred to me sort of seemingly out of nowhere one day, while I was like driving my car that I'd been blocking out um, anything other basically for as long as I could remember to, to varying extents. And I did have a period when I was about, I don't know, maybe 22 after that relationship had ended where I remember crying and telling my mom, like, there's no, it feels like there's no magic in the world. I don't like this worldview. Um, you know, I'm going to sort of let, go of a lot of this now and that was kind of a healing but sort of simultaneously pa painful process um but then i realized like i still sort of mutter these little i guess you would call them prayers like don't let me see anything in here especially if i ever start feeling you know that feeling you get if you go into a building or something or or somewhere in nature where you feel like there's something you can't see there or something, you know, to, to that effect. And so I told my therapist actually, yeah, I used to have these weird experiences as a kid. Um, and, and actually, you know, I sort of still have them, but I think I'm trying to have fewer of them and maybe I would be having more. I don't know. I don't know that I want to have more, but I, but it's a blockage. And she was like, right, well, let's work on that. So we, we did, um, and then at, at some point I sort of said to, you know, God, spirit, whatever, like, okay, you can take the block off now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I felt great about doing that. I do feel like since then though, that was, I guess, over a year and a half ago, I do feel like there's been a big, um, sort of increase of <laughs> activity or happenings or, or whatever. Um, but I still don't have any, you know, thoughts about what to do with that, why that is, maybe it just is. And, you know, there's not really a reason, but, um, I've been with other people when they've experienced these sort of strange, strange happenings. Um, like, I think I had written to you about the spoon that went flying in my kitchen, you know, when my husband was with me. And, um, then I'm always sort of wondering, like, should I, I feel like I should know what to do about this or with this, you know, like, is there a, a message like should I be able to correlate it to something um but then I'm sort of afraid I guess to kind of really like I've I've seen you you know tell people to sort of meditate and connect with things and I I think I probably do need to do that and I'm actually just kind of putting it off because I'm I'm actually afraid I guess um I don't know of what actually maybe just the general unknown yeah, I mean, I mean, two things there, I guess. Um, don't do anything you don't want to do. You know, listen to that. If 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 you're feeling, mm, you know, I'm not, I'm not ready to to look at that or to open uh, to what might be behind this kind of threshold, then you know, you need to listen to that and don't be harsh on yourself either, because you will know when it is the right time, if it ever is the right time. So I don't think you need to mm. worry about that. I think, um, you know, that that whole do, do what you want to do, don't do what you don't want to do. And just, um, you know, feel, feel, feel okay about that. I think the main thing is that you, you said that you felt good about just making your peace with the, the blockage that you had decided to impose at a certain time in your life for you know good reason at the time if you spoke to that person that you were then you know they were doing that for a, for good reason so that they could function in the world so that's 
entirely understandable, isn't it? But mm, what yeah. what do you think? Um, what was it that you saw as a child that you felt you were harking back to? Do you remember? Um, do you mean what did I see as a child that made me sort of want to block things out? Yeah, or? yeah. Um, if you were sort of having to feel afraid about seeing things. I can't, I mean, the few, the few things that I remember seeing were not really scary. Mm. Like, for example, that man that I saw in the red coat. But I think oftentimes when I went into older buildings or other people's houses, I would sense, I think, I think what was happening is that I was sensing that there was something there. Um, and I would sort of see things in my mind's eye as opposed to, you know, these other things I saw sort of directly, certainly as if they were right in front of me. Um, and that really freaked me out and it made me feel very uneasy. And if I ever told people about it, say the people that I was with, like I remember staying in a hotel in San Francisco in a very old house, you know, for the West Coast of America, very old. And it was a very beautiful hotel. And I, I think I was seven that year. Um, and I asked the hotel owner, because immediately I just got a sense of a really kind of frightening presence. I just immediately felt like, oh my God, there's a really scary ghost in here in a very specific sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I asked him, is, is this hotel haunted or is the house haunted? And he said, oh no, and kind of laughed at me. And that just pissed me off as a kid. Yeah. Like, I think yeah. I hated being infantilized in general, but also I felt like, well, sorry, sir, to let you know, but it is haunted, but I wasn't yeah. going to say that because that would have been rude. Um, <laughs> and then I spent the entire night kind of like not sleeping that well in this like sort of state of abject terror because I felt like I could feel something. And then I later found out what, like when we were checking out, my mom said, oh, I, we're never going back there. That was such a scary place. I really felt like I could feel a creepy presence. She told me, because her and my dad had one room and my sister and I had a different room. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of like the only two rooms in that area, but they were down the hall from each other just by the you know design of old houses. Yeah. Um, and she was really concerned about us and you know she's not usually a warrior so that was kind of strange and but I only found that out after the fact um, which of course made me feel better but I remember thinking like I wish I didn't know this because I can't see it I don't want to see it and clearly other people like this man who owns this hotel of course he could have had experiences and just not been wanting to tell the children of paying clientele like yes sure. it's very haunted by a violent ghost you know <laughs> um i wouldn't blame him for that either way but to me at the time it kind of seemed like all that happened is he sort of laughed at me and thought i was a stupid kid and i hated that as a kid mm -hmm. um you know and also that it just was disturbing my sleep and mental state and it was like wouldn't it be nice to be all these other people in this hotel that seemed to be just going about their business <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, i know and yeah. yeah, it didn't seem like a useful skill. And I actually kind of thought I was just really, really paranoid. And the older I've gotten, the more I've been like, oh, I think like I was surprised to hear on, you know, different podcasts or reading different things that to to come across people saying, yeah, I'm clear, um, clairsentient, you know, or I, I sort of see things in my mind's eye, clairvoyant. And I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't even know that that counted. Um, I had never been talked to about that being like a psychic skill. Yeah. Um, and so I was sort of almost like gaslighting myself, like caught between, I'm pretty sure it's real, but also other people think it's not real. So maybe I'm just really scared. And um, I had other experiences as a kid uh, that weren't scary, like when a grandparent passed, um, feeling the, them come into my room and sit down on the bed and feeling a hand on my shoulder. And I felt the bed and there was an indentation, but it felt wonderful. Like I, I immediately yeah. knew that they'd passed and I was like, oh, he's okay. But it yeah. was sort of one of those things like, well, you just know that you won't be telling any of your friends about this. And um, I think that was another reason that it just felt like there was nothing to do with it. I didn't know how to handle it. I think it also used to possibly give me headaches. Um, 
mm. and sort of make me feel really tired. I, I think I felt sometimes physical symptoms from different things and, you know, that, that bothered me. And I think I just didn't, I just realized, sorry, I don't know if you want to backtrack that I was speaking about my, why there might be a family connection, the Polish side. And all I was going to say about the, oh, yeah. the family that went back to um, the British Isles is that I'd never heard that they were to my knowledge. And I don't have a lot of records other than sort of birth certificates, death certificates, marriage, things like that. Um, but my, um, my dad's side of the family is very musical and, I then found out through this conversation with my parents that he used to be able to see auras as well as a child. So I do suspect there are things from that side of the family also. Yeah. I know yeah. when I lived in Britain, for when I was doing my master's, I had a number of experiences there, which kind of made me wonder if they were, were related to heritage or something. But also, as of course, as you know, Britain is just very old. Um, and I think it is very magical. I think there's a lot of spots with particular energies and things like that so that that could be why as well but um yeah I, th I think just as a kid I didn't know what to do with it and it was scary and I mostly they're worth I think I only would tell my mom if I actually saw something like I didn't realize you know occasionally I would have deja vu or um you know in sort of a really meaningful way I think I had deja vu had have it pretty frequently and or if I dream something and then it sort of happened immediately the next day or two days later um, or if I physically saw you know an apparition I would tell my mom about it but I never mentioned any of the other things that I was experiencing or or feeling um, I sort of thought it didn't count and I think that was part of the frustration as well um, I thought I was just being paranoid and I also always had this feeling as a kid that if I were to let my guard down that I would see the things I was feeling mm -hmm. um and I always at the time felt like god that's the last thing I need um mm -hmm. but now I feel like looking back every time I actually saw s some sort of fully formed apparition it was way less scarier mm -hmm. um <laughs> than sort of worrying about seeing something, you know, that old tactic, the movie Jaws, it's much scarier when you, until you, you know, it's not as scary looking at the shark as wondering where it is, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I can totally understand the fear of um, seeing the unknown, but also the tiredness as well, because there's such a disconnect between what we know to be true for us and then what we see out there in the world and reflected back at us or, or or told to us about the way that the world is. And we know that it's not like that. I mean, yeah. we all go along with it. We all do it. We all go along with all the nonsense. But we know <laughs> that it's not. We know that it's not that. And everyone, it, it's hard because you're saying you're looking around and it's like, well, everyone else is pretending everything's fine. Everyone else is pretending there's no such thing as this, this and this. And Mm -hmm. Or they're just completely closed down to it and they're not even going to consider the idea that there might be anything other than just this material hotel we're staying in and whatever, that they can't feel the energies in there. I wonder if they could and I wonder, we we just don't know, do we? But mm -hmm. it's, it's exhausting because there's this sort of, particularly when you're so sensitive, you're feeling all this stuff. There's part of you that's sort of processing all this stuff. There's another part of you closing that down. While mm -hmm. simultaneously you're having to pretend that everything's normal and that um, you're just kind of carrying on going. But there's like this part of yourself that's saying, acknowledge this. And I think we, we all have these gifts for a reason. So it might not be something that you, you might not realize what it is right now, but perhaps there is a reason that you are particularly sensitive. And I just wonder if it's something to do with um you know these people that you're seeing that seem to be well they're not they're not they don't appear to be human they don't feel human they're appearing mm -hmm. as sort of humans but they're not doing a very good job of it so they're they are something other than human these people that aren't people and maybe there's something that you can do to help I don't know I don't know I don't know what that is 
That that is the question. Like I think I never. My mom's been telling me my whole life. You know, you should write these things down. But they either felt in the moment like, well, it's like nobody's going to read them. If they do read them, maybe I don't want them to read them. You know, they're either they're not interesting. There's too many, but they're all kind of mundane. Of course, so when I started writing it out, I was like, okay, well, it's sort of a lot, and it is interesting because. I, I do feel like some of these things have been, you know, ghosts or spirits of that that type, you know, human spirits who are no longer living. Um, and those seemed pretty mundane, really, you know, it, it's, it's almost like a time slip. Maybe it was a time slip. I don't know. But the other, the people that aren't people, they seem to always be interacting mm. and they always initiate the interaction um, and I didn't think about that until I had written you, you know, about one story. I was kind of realizing like, there's at least, I don't know, six or eight of them. And they don't, that's kind of the, that's, I guess the big similarity is that they all have that feeling of people that aren't people and they all look so close to normal, you know, yeah. um, like an artist's rendering of a human or something, you know, it's so, <laughs> so close, but there's always something really off. And I guess, sorry, there's one exception. Like my friend and I had an encounter with a man. Well, we didn't really have an encounter. We felt that we had an encounter. He didn't seem to see us at all with a man that was walking by in Barcelona. Um, and we were totally awestruck. And my friend looked at me and said, I think that's an alien. And I was like, what? <laughs> I can't believe you also noticed this. No one else seemed to be paying him any attention. And again, it's a big, big city, but I, she was totally like, what on earth was that? But he didn't make any, he didn't look at us or anything. There was no contact the, the others though, there was always some sort of, there's been some sort of interaction and it always really kind of puts me on my toes, you know, like if sort of, if you say that feeling of, if you say the wrong thing, it might not go the way you're hoping. And I don't, they've never asked, well, other than that guy that was technically hitchhiking, like they, they've never really asked me for anything. I don't, I don't know what the, I'm sort of curious if I ever went to live like, you know, for a prolonged period of time in, you know, the countryside in an, in an older country or something, if I would see more of these people who aren't people. Um, I, I think sometimes they can be hard to pick out in, in big cities, you know, because there's so many, there's just a lot going on and there's so many different types of people on the street. And the only reason I've, you know, even had these interactions is people have come up and sort of spoken to me or me and whoever I was with and it just felt really wrong. Mm -hmm. um, this section is available for all members of the Curious Crew who support me on Patreon. Join us there for this and more bonus content. Patreon.com forward slash the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast. But yeah, there are some things that I can suggest, some other things that I can suggest that you do. So maybe Yeah, we can that talk would be great. That. I, I yeah. would love to hear any yeah. any suggestions from you yeah it's helpful and also um so one of the crew is going to do the banishing pentagram workshop next Ooh. when is it it's later this month isn't it it's july 26 i think it is they're going to do that so that would be great because yes that, that would that be would great give you lots of uh tools to to use um well that's just a very powerful tool to use and that's one that i actually use which is the banishing pentagram i was taught that many many years ago by this amazing woman who i talk about a lot i'd love to talk to her again because she is still around um back in the day at these these workshops that was one of the things that she taught us and you can even do it distance so you don't need to be in the house when you do it you can visualize going through your house room by room Mm. And doing this this banishing ritual, banishing. Um, so um, there are a number of things that you can do, but um, so don't don't really have to sort of suffer with that. Um, yeah, that would be great. I I need to speak to my sister, my mother about this as well because they we had um 
lots of haunting activity in the house I grew up in as a child, which my mother and father uh, are still in, and my sister's there currently at this time with them. Um, and I was gone working um, abroad in the fall, and my I, I had actually stayed there a bit before I left and had really weird experiences there, um, like sort of poltergeisty activity. Um, but then I went and stayed at a hotel with my husband for a little bit. And we had, especially me, had similar experiences there. So I sort of thought actually that maybe it was just me. But then when I left, my sister and my father were talking and they heard a giant crash. I think, it, I think they said it was from, from my old sort of like childhood bedroom that I'd been staying in. And they went up to check. Of course, nothing was amiss except my prized paper mache horse, which I got when I, my mother had let me buy it when I was like two from a, you know, like a charity shop. Yeah. And its leg had, had been broken. And I'm so mad about that, first of all, because yeah. we're having, I'm really trying to fix it. <laughs> and it's, we're really having a hard time reattaching it. Um, but also that, that should not have fallen, first of all, based on where it was on the shelf. And it should, it certainly would never have made a crash. I mean, it's made of paper. It's very, mm. very light. Um, and my sister, I guess, commented to my dad and said, that's really weird. And he said, I hear weird noises all the time when nobody's home in this house. Like, I right. think <laughs> there it's, it's been weird. Um, and then of course they all started talking to each other and sort of putting it together. And I was, ended up telling my sister, like, I think you need to do like sort of a banishing ritual and, and, and I can't do it because I'm gone. And she was like, what do I do? Right. And I was, I actually, um, consulted, um, J. Allen Cross's book, which is, I think it's called the witch's guide to the paranormal, um, which I bought for that mm -hmm. particular purpose and had sent her, um, some, you know, sort of things to try from, yeah. um, even though, you know, that's not something that's necessarily in her, um, she certainly doesn't, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be called a witch, but, um, you know, has a lot of uh, spiritual beliefs. So I was like, well, give it a try. And the night that she had time to do it, of course, it was like a full moon and there was a thunderstorm and, you know, just sort of as dramatic as possible. Um, and, so she went around in each room and, you know, did something sort of similar, I think. And she felt that it was pretty effective. Um, and the activity mostly died down. Um, but then apparently the, their cleaners who come every sort of few weeks had told my mom that, that they think, um, there's an energy in the house, which they've oh, never said anything like that goodness. recently. And, uh, my mom is, uh, technically Catholic and so were the, the cleaners and they said, do you, you know, do you have any holy water? I think you should sprinkle holy water and sort of say some prayers, um, which was really fascinating. Really? So yeah. I think I'll have to, you know, pass this on because it sounds like they're also having some maybe unwanted visitors, especially for the, the cleaners to, to sort of say something, I, I think is pretty, massive, pretty telling. Definitely, definitely, definitely. You have to ask them what, it, what, what gives that, what gives them the impression that they, they said, need to do that as well. Apparently the cleaners had said that they felt like they, it, that it's sort of impossible to go fast there, that they always feel like they, clean slower there and they said there's only two houses we felt this in and they said it used to be worse it's better now but it still feels a little bit like being in molasses and that is very true in that house we actually joke it's it's a very peaceful house it's very pretty it's on a canyon preserve but we always called it sleepy house because even my husband thought it was ridiculous until he stayed there a little bit and was like oh my god it does it just comes over you like two o'clock certainly by three o'clock, it's like, what's the Disney movie Sleeping Beauty? Like there's just oh, sort of yeah. a sleeping spell over everything. And it's sort of, impo it's, and we always sort of thought, well, it's just very relaxing, but, and it, it doesn't have a bad feeling, especially now. Um, but it does have a feeling like this sort of slowy molasses-y feeling. Um, and I thought maybe it was just sort of a particular way the light comes in or something, and that maybe that could be part of it, but I thought it was really interesting that unprompted the cleaners were like, yeah, yeah, this is just sort of, you know, they weren't, it's not like they were using it as an excuse to sort of not do anything. I mean, they do a wonderful job and 
work really hard every time, but they just sort of said, yeah, we, it's better than it used to be here, but we really think you need to kind of get, get the energy out, whatever it is. It just slows everything down here. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that is quite telling. Well, it is. When you, when you learn um, these techniques, then you'll be able to, to go and do that for them without being there. So that, yeah. that would be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. But, Oh, you've um, definitely there. There's there's so much going on, isn't there? And it'll be interesting to see how it it develops. I mean, this time has been particularly active. The last couple of years, I've noticed that there's been a lot more activity. So it might just be this, you know, playing out. And and perhaps mm. when you move, it'll be interesting to see what happens when you move as well. And and yeah. see, you know, what it's what it's like to be there, and and also just how things um, unfold for you in terms of, you know, whether you decide to explore any of this further, and and either it doesn't mean you have to use it for anything. It's just kind of reclaiming that side of yourself. If you then decide. I feel that this is a very important part of myself and I, um, you know, I would like to, to to use this to help others, then that's maybe what you might do. And for other people, it's just, they just acknowledge that there's, they have this within them and that's enough. That's all, that's enough. And it, and it just feels peaceful to be able to do that, to, to be seen and to, you know, reclaim their, their whole themselves yeah. as a whole so that you know it might just be enough to do that and it might just all of these different things happening it feels like they're all trying to get your attention um I don't know what you think about the idea that um the the guy in the flame hoodie that with the um flame mm, writing mm-hmm. and the the hitchhiker um and the guy that tried to pat the dog whether you think that that could potentially be the same being that's turning up or whether they have very, very different feelings. I hadn't considered that. I'll have to think on that and maybe I will meditate on it. I, I don't know. I don't know if I want this part of my answer in the, in the podcast. If you, if you choose to publish any of it, which of course is fine. But, um, I think I, I think I, Instinctively, my feeling is that I will end up doing something with it. I, I think I'm actually supposed to be getting a message that I'm like being kind of almost intentionally obtuse about mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. Um, part of it is because I'm so busy with my music that I'm yeah. sort of like, not now, please. It's almost like somebody that keeps calling you and you keep pressing yeah. silent or something. I think I am being sort of intentionally like sticking my head in the sand, um, (laughs) about it. And, uh, and I think it will probably continue until I am receptive to engaging with it in whatever way that that means. But I've been, and actually you're one of the only people that I've come across who has sort of said, you know, yes, it, you know, you can meditate on these things if it feels right and sort of set boundaries. People seem to either be like, don't do it. It's so dangerous. Don't interact with these beings unless they're already interacting with you, which I thought was sort of interesting. I think Morgan Daimler had said that. And I was sort of like, well, maybe I'm in that category already then. Um, and then other people are sort of like, oh, they're all, you know, like the Disney version of these Victorian, um, Cottingley fairies. It's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Have at it. Um, so I did actually feel kind of reassured from hearing you say that even to other people. And I feel more, re- way more reassured hearing you say it to me. So thank you. Cause I think I will have to, I think that to me, it kind of feels, I guess, intuitively, like that's the only road, <laughs> but you know, I don't know what that road is, but it, it does feel like that's the only way to progress forward. Otherwise I think, um, I don't really think it's going to, I don't necessarily want it to stop. It's not necessarily terrifying, but, um, I, I think I, yeah, I just get, 
I, I get the sense for whatever that's worth that that is the direction it's going to have to go. I don't know um, what what I'm supposed to do with it, or if there's just a message and I'm ignoring the message because I'm sticking my head in the sand. Um, the, the thing is with these situations is that it's almost like we get used to wanting to know the answer. Okay, if I do this, then what will happen? If I do this, when will happen? Mm. What you can do, um, I found, and you know, this has been a lesson for me over the years as well, is just to trust as long as it feels right do not do anything that does not feel right however if you feel right look I can't ignore this anymore there's something that's trying to get my attention here okay once you kind of say okay I'm listening <laughs> that's the other thing you can you can sort of say you can say it out loud you can say it you know in your in your head right I'm listening you've got my attention I'm listening do the meditation, as I say, with all of the necessary um, protective techniques, first of all. And then what you might find is that there's then something opens up. It might be a sign of some sort. You might meet somebody, like you say, and they have a message for you. And then that's that bit. And then the next bit reveals itself, as in now you need to do this. And again, you could decide to just ignore that or you could remain open and say, okay, I will go along with this. Again, as long as it feels right, don't get let, you know, led down any garden path. If it feels like something is amiss, then trust the mm. instinct. Okay. Um, but if you do that, what you tend to find, what I found is that things are revealed when they're ready. So it's not like you're going to do this, 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 and this, and you're going to see how it's going to unfurl. Mm -hmm. The whole point is that you don't. The whole point is that you trust that flow. If it feels like a flow that you can trust, and believe me, you'll know whether you can or not, whether you can mm. trust it. But if it feels right, then things just are unveiled in their own time. And that's part of this sense of communion with the divine or whatever it is that we're communing with to trust that. It's a very different thing if it's something that is causing you trouble and it needs dealing with there. And then that's an entirely different thing. And as I said, you would, you know, be very clear about that and remove it from your home or your life or what, you know, wherever it is. But mm. if it's something that is knocking and it sounds to me like whatever this energy is, it just keeps knocking. And, um, you know, here I am again, here I am again. It feels like there's something to potentially either deal with or respond to and only you know the answer to that nobody else can tell you the answer to mm. that you will know it but trust trust that you know that and trust that you'll be led to do what it is you need to do wow that's amazing i can i ask you a question i i sure. feel i know i should i probably shouldn't be the one asking the questions <laughs> um, no, no, go for it when you and you've spoken, you know, especially on your podcast about when you first saw, you know, the little, the little man, um, when you were out with your then, you know, partner now husband, I think, right. Mm -hmm. Um, did you feel that that was an initiation of some sort? I don't even mean in like a ritual magic sense, although I suppose it could be. Um, but did you feel that there was a spark that was there for a reason and that it became a sort of, again, knocking at your door? I'm just sort of like, I no. mean, I, I've heard you speak about, really? It just sort no. of felt like something that just happened. It just happened. And it's only now that I'm doing this and that, you know, even, even when, you know, I, the, the, the man that I was with, of course, then um you know became my husband so that's a big big thing to happen not long after that because the guy that I went to to ask about this we ended up then working together in a group and that grew and is is still going in its own form um you know and it's very meaningful to me so that happened as a you know these really really big things in my life that were very very important to me and, and remain very important to me and then, of course, my husband even drawing the the logo of the the man that, that is the podcast mm -hmm. logo. 
Yeah. And it wasn't, he didn't draw it for this podcast. He drew it because me and Mark Norman were going to Dartmoor um, to do some fairy research for the Magical Folk book. And I wanted to do a poster saying, have you seen this man? That's that's what the logo was initially drawn for, his face. Mm. And then the words, have you seen this man? So this is what I'm saying. Huh. Every point there, I didn't know what the next step was going to be, but for me, it felt like it wasn't right to, I guess I just kind of sat with the experience for a while because I didn't init- in- immediately tell my husband it wasn't until I think it must have been, I feel like it was months later. It could have been weeks later. If it was weeks later, then it was a good, it was a good chunk of weeks later. Mm. Um, and, you know, I did tell, tentatively tell a friend and then she kind of didn't really respond in the way that I I hoped she might. And then my, then I kind of perhaps just sort of kept it to myself a little bit. And it was, it, it was, it was then the guy that I spoke to as I say, that we then, you know, started wo- working together because we, we, you know, I let my guard down with him and told him about what I'd seen and, um, and we sort of developed a, a, a friendship, a trusting friendship after that and began working together. So at each point, you know, I didn't know that seeing that being would lead to me telling this guy which led to me working with the group and actually had other experiences with that group that I could never have known you know when I started Mm. out on this path um and then you know for my for me to go and work with Ronald that none none of this has ever been planned or laid out in advance but the only thing I can say is that I've trusted my instinct at each step I've trusted when I felt I need to be going and doing this or this feels right to me to do that or um you know I've never sort of questioned what it was for only that I knew this was what how it was meant to be at that point at that very point in time I knew what I had to do and that's it um and then you know but now I look back I can just see how this led to that to that to that to that you know to to where we are now and I I now look at back at that meeting and now I feel like I knew at the time he I kept the one thing I came away with was that he wanted me to see him was the only sure thing that I knew about that experience I didn't know anything else really apart from what he looked like to me how it felt and the only reason that it happened you know I didn't know anything about that but the 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 feeling was he wanted me to see him so now from where I am doing doing what I'm doing now which I never planned to do at any point whatsoever um I realize that maybe that's why he wanted me to see him so that I could be doing this now and even that just feels kind of there's there's something that runs through me when I say that and I'm not entirely sure what that is it's like a sort of a sort of makes you want to take a deep breath really or 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 take a moment to sort of realize that because even just saying that sounds completely mad as if I'm talking about someone else's life but really (laughs) this is how it makes sense to me now. And I think that I'm coming to realize that that perhaps was the reason that I saw him, whether it was that he allowed me to see him so that I would do this or whether that chance moment was, I don't know. Sort I, of I have no idea. Yeah. I, I don't know whether it was, something within me that was ready to see him at that point or whether it was something within him that um maybe there was a link between us already maybe he had uh um chose that moment to make himself known and i just don't know i just don't know but i i feel like there is meaning between having seen him and me doing this now, particularly as 
he's there you know in that in that logo which was not Mm -hmm. drawn as a logo as I say it was just drawn as a representation of a fairy man uh, because it was the one that my husband had drawn on my uh, description and it, it it's not exactly the man that I saw but it's a good representation of his vibe Mm. um and uh yeah so no i i i definitely go with the sort of go with your instinct and go with the flow of things if it feels like a flow Mm. would always be my advice i'm so so grateful to you for that because it is a very strange um they're seeing those things and then And that's weird enough, I think, actually. And then if you have, you know, repeated experiences throughout your life, you do start to wonder, like, should I do something with this? Am I meant to do something with this? Can I do something with this? Am I being safe? You know, I think it's... um, I think think there with those questions, you're thinking too much. It's like, Hmm. just feel instead. Mm. I mean... If we all do it, and I do it as well, and we get ourselves in such a tangle, <laughs> but it's all these mm-hmm. questions, and actually, just feel. What does your body, if you say to yourself, right, okay, I am going to um, meditate and try and connect with blah, 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 whatever it is. How does that feel in your body? Does your body open to that and feel like, oh, yeah, that feels really good? Or, oh, no, I'm kind of closing up and this doesn't, either feel right whether it feels right now and it will feel right another if it feels wrong now maybe it'll feel right another time or for you know um maybe it will never feel right but right now this feels wrong and you need to listen to that so so feel into the sense of it rather than question because you just will tie yourself in knots you know because that that sounds right (laughs) yeah and if you just practice doing that with just the small stuff, you'll you'll get into you'll get into that being second nature because it is it is just part of our nature. But we mm. we tend to um, question instead with our minds. Yeah, and there is a, there is a place for that too. I mean, minds are we we need our minds, of course, and we need <laughs> clarity, and we need to be able to make decisions, and we need to be able to you know, think clearly and all the rest of it. But actually, I think often for me, what I've found particularly recently is that the truth and the the sense, um, the real sense of what I need to be doing comes from the, the feeling of what it feels like in my body. And having switched to trusting that instead, things are just so much easier. They're so much easier. Life is just so much more straightforward. I love that. That's very freeing, actually. Yeah, it's massively freeing. It really is. It really, really is. We really do need more of that right now. I I certainly do, but I was just sort of thinking the world in general. We're all, I feel like everybody's very tied up in knots right now. Not that we're not dealing with, you know, so many different types of, you know, global crises, but, um, yeah, I think that's sort of a skill that we've almost almost lost mm-hmm. as a sort of a society. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I I think because I, I remember the first time I was introduced to the idea of meditation as being something I could do, I was so confused. Like, well, but what does it do? <laughs> like, I how do I do it? I just sit there and what? You know, it's sort of. Um, I think initially it kind of that type of existence, which is really so much healthier, almost feels counterintuitive to our kind of, you know, daily modern grind. Yeah, exactly. We were too busy to stop and feel what we need to do. And and half the time we're being told, well, this is what you need to do. And, you you know, just get on with it. So we lose, we, the feeling in us that says, nope, don't do that or this doesn't feel right we're taught to override that we're literally taught to override that in in from, you know when we first go to school even or perhaps even earlier in nursery or even just at home yeah so we're 
you know, we're just so conditioned to um, override what we feel in our, in our bodies. So it is definitely a rediscovering of that, but it it's um it's been you know quite an epiphany for me to to um to discover that to rediscover that. So yes, I can imagine. See see how you see how you go with that, and and also keep me posted on on what what happens um, in terms of you know you've got this big move coming up as well, so. Mm. Yeah, I just... will. Yeah, I will keep you posted. I'm um, actually feeling much, much uh, better about it after our, after our chat. So thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> I, I do. I think those are very, um, it's that's very useful advice, and I'm really excited actually to try it out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But trust. Yeah, just it all comes back to just trusting how it feels for you so don't feel you have to push ahead with anything just because you felt it was going to mm. you know you plan to do this so therefore you're going to do it it's not like that at all you can just sense into it and um and trust it so and just you know f- see how that is as well because like you say I think that will be really freeing yeah I that. think so too I have yeah. a strong feeling that that's um that that's the case I'm super appreciative that you know I was able to chat to somebody about it and I so appreciate hearing your, you know, ex- I don't know if expertise is the word in these matters, but just sort of accumulated, you know, knowledge is really um, helpful and actually really affirming. Oh, I'm glad it was a few. So I'm, I'm definitely not an expert, but uh, we're, you know, as I say, when we share these encounters with each other, we start to sort of build a picture, don't we? And when you've, when you've had, experiences yourself you just yeah you um you you tune into that we were talking about that before weren't we that even Mm -hmm. when someone talks about the kind of encounter that is different to what you've experienced there are still these snippets of it that you recognize and you say oh yeah I know I know exactly how that feels when you experience that because I've experienced something similar so yeah thank you so much for a really interesting conversation and um yeah, I um, I w- would love to chat to you another time too. Yeah, I would um, love that also. Thank you so much, Joe. I really, really appreciate it. thanks to our guest for all these magnificent stories. There are a number of aspects of this conversation which I'd like to pick up on. Firstly, as I said at the beginning, these sorts of encounters can of course be explained away as simple observances or meetings with people who, for whatever reason, stand out as unusual to us. As human beings, we are built with a natural evolutionary alert system to establish situations that may present danger in some way. Yet, if you have met one of these people, you will know exactly the kind of feelings that our guest is trying to describe. There's a real sense that these people are not from this realm. Other examples are men in black or black-eyed children phenomena. You cannot quite explain why, but you experience an intense fear and knowing that something is wrong. I have no idea who or what these beings are that our guest has encountered, but we do know, according to other guests' accounts, that fey beings can shapeshift. It's part of their nature. I do wonder whether they are in some cases potentially the same being returning in different guises. And if so, then why? In the first instance, the red-headed Irish family seem to appear out of nowhere and from several different directions to surround our guest and her family. It's interesting to note that the car park and shop were built on a location which was once a farm owned and lived upon by an Irish family. That would link the visitation to the location, which, as we know from previous episodes, is something that can explain a fairy encounter. Places hold an energy as if they are a person. From an animist perspective, and in some indigenous cultures such as the Ojibwe people of central Canada, 
or the Maori people of New Zealand, environments, ecosystems and features within the landscape are understood as persons in their own right. Could it be that in certain circumstances, the Fae are some kind of manifestation of location that decides to commune with human beings? Or are they there all the time, but only certain people can perceive them? And if so, what is the message? Was there an important point being made about the loss of green spaces? After all, the farmland was now replaced by a huge supermarket and tarmacked car park. Did the world really need another supermarket? Or did it need the green space that once flourished there? We might laugh at the naivety of that thought, but the joke is ultimately on us. From another perspective, could the strange folk have simply been the ghosts of an Irish family who lived on that land previously? Or were these just heightened responses to human beings who looked a bit different to us? It's interesting, though, that both mother and daughter, usually sociable, outgoing people, experience the same sense of dread and seemingly irrational fear and a knee-jerk reaction to get away as soon as possible. And of course, the Irish family disappeared from view, as happened with a number of the other occurrences. The guy with the red lettering hoodie is another unsettling encounter. Again, it could simply be that both mother and daughter spotted similar-looking men in their respective vicinities, which triggered a similar response for each of them. I asked our guest after the show if anything significant happened in the family around that time. She replied that shortly after they saw this man, within the following few months, a family member was involved in a bad car accident and a difficult time followed for the entire family. Did this man's presence warn of what was to come? If so, what was the message? He seemed to express a dark, perhaps foreboding nature. It puts me in mind a little of the Mothman prophecies, where a number of residents in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in the 1960s received visitations from a dark winged creature and experienced various other phenomena before the Silver Bridge just outside their city collapsed, killing 46 people. Is it possible that some form of intelligence reaches out to us in an attempt to avoid disasters? Like with other more defined fairy encounters, if they appear frightening in some way, that may not be their intention in the way that we understand it in human terms. If it's some form of shadow side, what does that provoke in us? In life we can learn much more from expressions of our shadow, difficult personal challenges, than when life coasts along swimmingly. In the darkness we're forced to face what needs to transition in order to return, renewed, to the light. The Hitchhiker is my favourite story here, His character is particularly intriguing. The first thing I'm thinking here is that he appears to embody a significant amount of trickster energy, which can be understood as sacred. Tricksters are often found in conditions relating to transition. The fact that he is walking the boundaries of the town, or literally in the middle of the road. He displays opposites in the fact that he's an outsider to the community and is described as having long stringy hair yet well-clothed, albeit old-fashioned, but he looked clean. His status is ambivalent. His eyes are striking and he makes direct eye contact with a knowing smile. As a stranger, he's violating a taboo by crossing this personal boundary. Ten years later, when she sees him again, once in the same neighbourhood on a road which translates to Devil's Highway, and on another occasion in the middle of the road, he doesn't seem to have aged. Each time she observes him, she has a strange, terrifying feeling, though on the outside, as an older man, he may not have looked like a threat. The first time she saw him, she mentions it was during a time when she was driving independently, but still on a curfew. I later asked her if she felt it was the liminal period between childhood and adulthood, and whether this applied to the other sightings. She replied, I was definitely in a transitional period when I saw him around the age of 18, and that is very accurate about being in between childhood and adulthood. The second time I was preparing to move to the UK for my Masters. The third time I had just moved back from the UK, and it was still during the Covid lockdown, sort of just on the cusp of coming out of it, I believe, in 2021, 
also arguably very liminal times. So during certain liminal states in our lives, do we have a heightened awareness of these trickster beings that may even be human beings evoking a trickster energy or possibly otherworldly beings that we experience as some kind of response phenomena when moving through these states? It would be interesting to know whether her friend was moving through a transition too when they viewed him together. The other potential link that struck me was the similarity of this man and legendary stories of the wandering Jew. Dr Simon Young and Chris Woodyard recently released a really fantastic episode about this long-standing mythical figure who is in some versions said to be a Jewish man who met Jesus Christ while he was either carrying his cross or being nailed to the cross and he insults Christ in some way. In an angered response, Jesus curses him that he will live without the salvation of death until Christ returns to the earth. So you have this idea that an immortal continues to walk the earth for millennia. There are many documented accounts since the 13th century, and these are covered in Dr. Young's research source book, which I'll link to in the show notes. Of course, a lot of these old accounts over the centuries were based upon a general fear and suspicion of itinerance, and, particularly in accounts from Europe, anti-Semitism. So we need to remain mindful of this when understanding reports of these figures. But what's interesting in terms of the encounter in this episode is that these figures are often on the boundaries of society. They are mysterious strangers to communities, often with long white hair or beards, and with clothes that seem out of time in some way. This fits our guest's description, but the most fascinating aspect of all which made me link him to this legend is that he's not aged in the ten years since she saw him. As always, we simply don't know, and maybe we'll never truly understand all the aspects at play within these kinds of encounters. But I think all of us at some time or another have met someone that we felt was not of this realm. Maybe if you look back, they had a message for you at that time. What I absolutely loved in this share was the role of our guest's mother, who encouraged her daughters to meet the world with an open heart, but remain aware of the potential dangers and offered wise advice to make safe passage of potentially dangerous situations. As I said earlier on, it's within our own makeup as human beings to constantly assess danger in our everyday life whether it's crossing the road, going into new situations, even when eating meals. We do it without thinking about it. And when we meet people and it completely chimes wrong, what do we do? We're inclined to override it and tell ourselves to stop being silly. Is that different to how our ancestors would have responded? As always, even though some of these shares are unsettling, on the whole, I believe that the other worlds are reaching in to guide us through these transitional times. Whether these are messages about the natural environment, no more supermarkets and car parks please, or whether they are mysteriously supporting us or alerting us from the boundaries which mark shifts in our personal lives, they do appear at times to be consciously communing with us or at the very least catching our attention. What these messages mean is up to each of us to seek. I know you will enjoy the next two episodes with Kate and Claire, Bethan and Icy. I'll probably jump on for a quick intro on those episodes and I look forward to joining you again at the start of September for the new series. In the meantime, I hope you have a wonderful summer if you're in the Northern Hemisphere or winter in the Southern Hemisphere and don't forget you can join us on Patreon where I'll be continuing to make episodes during the summer and where we have our community. So do please support if you can. Much love to you, dear listener. Seek connection within and with each other and always remain curious. <laughs>